Welcome to the Nerve to Lead podcast. Here we explore power, pleasure, leadership, identity, belonging, parenting and couplehood and explore stories of navigating through life, finding both authenticity and attachment through the common lens of the nervous system. I am your host Sangeeta Bhattacharyati and I'm so glad you're here. Today I have Aaron Shelley with me. Aaron is a dad of four, worked in SaaS just like me and now is an entrepreneur. He runs Family Flywheel. Welcome Aaron. Hey, great to be here. Thanks for having me on the podcast and Geeta Thank you. Uh, so, Aaron, maybe you could start off by sharing a little bit about kind of your background, your story, and then we could go from there. All right. So, my story, if we start, I was an athlete when I was very young. I mean, I played a lot of sports, virtually all of them. I really liked competing. As I got through high school, I kind of was playing American football and got injured a few times and then decided I'm not going to make my money this way. And I was also very good in school. Um, so then I went into a university program to get an engineering degree, mechanical engineering. And when I was going through mechanical engineering, I realized that the best mechanical engineers partnered with bad business people would make bad decisions. And so I couldn't really control my desk. So then I was like, and I was trying to build some products, even in my engineering program, had a job with a diamond company that was making them for like oil drill bits. And I was making them for this other part and they just gave it no attention. So it frustrated me a lot. So then I was like, I got to get an MBA. I got to understand these decisions. And so I went and got an MBA and looking back, the decisions they were making were good business decisions, just frustrating for an engineer. But I kind of went on this MBA route. And by the way, my wife and I were married before I graduated with my MBA. And then we started an Irish dance business behind our house. So we kind of have taught that for 20 years now, but that's kind of been this ongoing business while I've done these other businesses. So after I finished my MBA, we started my wife's business. I worked at some startups and then I got a job at ancestry.com. I don't know if you're familiar with them. Yes, do genealogy. Yes. Yep. Yep. So they do genealogy. I worked in their operations. I was working in their keying department. So I traveled around India, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, China, Philippines, which was great. Gives you a very global perspective and a different cultural perspective. Lived in Russia before I went to school for two years as well. So I kind of have this broad cultural perspective of just seeing how different cultures work. So then I went to so Ancestry. Then I worked at a startup uh, again in this just a genealogy startup. Didn't work out. And then I was actually researching my mom connected me with this research guy at the university about business and family, because there's different rates of starting businesses, depending on certain factors in the US and he was examining those. So as part of that, I was researching families, and how those family structure affects business startups. Um, in the course of that, I was like, hey, I think I have a better model for you to use. Because I'm in this business world, I was doing consulting. Sounds like you've done some of that as well, you know, strategic yeah. consultancy, seeing the business, seeing the family. And then I said, here's a better model. And the guy said, nope, that's your book, not mine. And I said, I didn't really want to write a book, though. <laughs> so <laughs> it wasn't it wasn't my goal. I just love knowledge and I love learning. So I kind of wrote the book, had it mostly done in about 2018. But then a friend of mine called me up and said, hey, can you come work at our the SaaS company for me? as a development manager, there was about 20 people. Um, over the next three and a half years, we grew it to about 180 people. And at the end, we raised 54 million in uh, private equity. And then I worked there for a year. And then I had the opportunity to step back. And now I'm like, I got to get back to this family stuff, because that was important to me. And part of the reason it was so important was, when I was researching the book, my mom had sent me an article about one of my friends, we had grown up in the same neighborhood, gone to the same church, gone to the same high school, everything, we were very close. I mean, his parents had been divorced and he was with his stepdad, but everything else was very similar. So socioeconomics were the same. Well, she had sent me an article about 10 years after I'd graduated, hadn't seen him, and it said he was going to prison for life 
for rape and attempted murder of this 18 year old woman. And I was like, wait, what, what happened here? How did we go from this guy I played football with and went to church with to now he's going to prison and I'm a father and I have four kids and I have a happy marriage. And so that's where I kind of obsessed in the book. And that's kind of, I was honestly obsessing about the book through all this time growing the company. And that's where I saw more of the principles of family and business together. And that's where I saw this huge overlap. I don't know if you've noticed the same thing, but a oh, lot of times yes. you see the overlaps are huge, right? Mm -hmm. Oh my God, yes. I think it, this is so important because there's almost this dichotomy, right? So when you're building and you're an entrepreneur, there is also a bias towards running the VC, the private equity, the tech rat race and becoming a unicorn. And mm -hmm. um, it's not cool or sexy to run a solopreneur business or what you call a small business or, or even a, like a services business. Or, yeah, lifestyle, this, the lifestyle mm -hmm. business, right? That's what they often call them. Yeah, and, and that's reductive at best. Uh, but also it's not sexy because when we're very deliberate about family sort of values and we design a lifestyle around it, it also involves critically questioning a lot of these systems at work, you know, for, for us, for me and, you know, our family, that's an ongoing discussion as to how you, well, we can't live, live off the grid. We just can't, nobody can, you know, and therefore, yes, capitalism is messy and all of that. And there is a reality of engaging in this world and then also creating this buffer for my children, etc. So it's like, how do we engage with it on our own uh, on terms? You know, like, how do we do this? So it does involve critically analyzing everything that you grew up with. But also, uh, you have to question the status quo. Otherwise, you're never going to uh, get off that hamster wheel. And this is from somebody <laughs> who was unquestioningly, you know, pledging allegiance to this you know, American dream, then you add this gender layer to it. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, I mean, I absolutely see what you're saying about building a business and family and nobody talks about this. Right? So when you're building, you are a monolith, you're like a startup co-founder, you are a CEO, and you are building as if you don't have a life. And then in family, you still have to do these, you are doing these roles as if you don't have anything else to do. I think that's the expectation on both sides. And I think that's why it's fascinating the work you do. Yeah, I think it's like you say, it's interesting too, I think a little bit when you're first married, you're always, you're kind of in that same startup phase of just like, how do we make this work? And you have to have so much energy put into the marriage because you're sitting there trying to go, well, who's going to do what work? I mean, like my wife was teaching Irish dance classes and I was doing all the technical stuff, but then there were points after we had a baby and she'd say, okay, you got to take care of the baby. So I'm changing diapers, making meals, going shopping, whatever the family needs. Right. And that's where I think sometimes people get caught up where they're like, no, I'm going to just do my one role. And you're going in a family, just as in a small business, it doesn't matter if it's your role or not, someone has to do it. And it just becomes a negotiation between the founders in the business sense or the parents in the family sense about how to best accomplish that. So there's always these trade-offs you're playing with, like, well, do I want more money, but less time to develop, to invest in the relationships with my wife and with my kid? Or do I want more money but or less money, but then I have more time to develop those things? So that I think it's always a trade-off. And I think for women, it's often much trickier because when they're having a baby, just that whole process is so energy intensive. So then they're like, well, I'm trying to work. And I, my wife would teach Irish dance classes when she's eight months pregnant, you know? Like, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there's those things. And I'm like, well, I can't grow the baby. So you've got to do that part. So then I've got to pick up the, you know, a little more on other areas, especially right when the baby comes, then the wife is needs to recover. And so then you need to pick up more slack. But then as the baby gets older and the wife recovers, things can change back. But it's a very dynamic, it needs to be a dynamic relationship. And often I think this is kind of in the business sense, this is where you'd get help from other other entrepreneurs or mentors or that type of thing. And in the family, if you're smart, then you can get it from your parents right? or his parents. You know, I, my mom came and lived with us for a while when we were you know, that first week and my mother-in-law came for another week during that first exchange, because there's just so much that you don't know as a new parent. 
Oh, yes, yes. And I think culturally, birth was never meant to be done alone. And birth was held in the village and everything was held in community. And it's still very common for South Asian parents to come and live with children in the early years. And we had both our children in the UK and parents were there for three or four months for each baby. And then after we've moved here, that's one of the reasons we moved here as well. They got in loss on tap. They live about 30 minutes away and it's that uh, buffer knowing that they're just a call away. And I have my sister that's moved in like five, 10 minutes away from where I am. And yeah, I don't think we were ever meant to do this alone, child, child raising and all of that. And the similarities are so striking. The more I grow my business and the skills, the way we run our household has changed. The way we run our relationship and parenting has also changed in parallel. Mm-hmm. And I don't mean it in like a, you're running your marriage like a business and you're taking all the passion and spontaneity out of it. It's not that. But I think when you the same sort of that co-founder energy you get things done but also I think there's a lot to be said for zooming out and looking at marriage as a very long-term thing you know I think that's the fascinating piece and uh, I personally have gotten caught up you know this has been my evolution of looking at it as a like a quid pro quo and gender roles and all of that which is there you know there's obviously patriarchy and gender roles and culture and trauma and but within that I think what that's my work is that yes you do have all of these collective systems at play which make it hard uh, extra hard for one person in the partnership whether it's your business or the family but then also how do you build that cushion and then stay in that interpersonal oxytocin filled sort of that love bubble where you can actually look at it as here's what needs to be done and who's going to do it without really letting all of those other things hijack the functioning of and again this is i'm talking about relationships where there's trust and love and i'm not talking about abuse right or whatever you know sure. when, even in that, I, for the growth has been to not look at it as a short-term quid pro quo, but mm-hmm. zoom out and look at it over a period of time. And I think uh, coming back to India has kind of helped that process because now I, I'm very close to elderly, like my parents are old, my in-laws are old. And, you know, when you live in these communities, like where my parents live and then you see like bedridden older women and men who just completely do everything for years and you're like okay so like if you really zoomed out and again I'm talking about you know marriages where there's not you know abuse right Mm -hmm. where I think it it also like evens out and for you to be able to zoom out and see the big picture I think is big well, yeah, you you worked pretty hard in the SaaS world, right? So this is where an interesting place where you say quid pro quo. A lot of times our society seems recently has been like, well, you need to do half of all this work and I'll do half of all this. Exactly. Yeah. It, it's a very bizarre thing. But if you went to a company and you said, I will give you 50%, they would mm-hmm. say, we're not hiring you, right? Because we want 100%. And that's where I think what we have, and I think we actually have an increase in passion if we treat it in some ways like a business. If I say I'm in the sales department, you did some sales stuff, right? Sales is the sexy, they make all the money and everyone goes, wow, it's so awesome. And it's phenomenal. You need that sales team. But then you also need the product team who's building the product and helping the customer. And so if you have that specialization and it's a healthy company, to your point about abuse, I think we see this in companies, the salespeople are like, we love the product people because you do something I'm not doing and it helps our customers and I can't do it without you. And the product people are saying, I don't want to talk to the customers. I want to build products. So I'm so grateful you're doing this. And so there's, if done right, there's this mutual gratitude in the business and it's super energetic and synergetic and it's super fun to work at those places and i think the same happens in a family is if you look at the husband and the wife and however you decide to divvy it up who's going to work and taking care of kids then if you're looking at these roles then you appreciate the other person right you're like oh thank you so much for making the meal i appreciate it i've made meals and i've had my wife make them right i live in utah so it's very snowy and we have to i have to clear the snow 
And it's my job. I, have, I accept it. But every time I come in from doing it, my wife says, thank you so much for doing that. Right. She doesn't have to. It's my job, but she appreciates it. And so Absolutely. that to me is this side in the business. It's if you take that principle from the marriage and you move it to a business, like you want to appreciate all the other people in the business because they help make you successful. And then you appreciate everyone in the family because they help make you successful. And that's where I think there's this in the family. We often are trying, like you say, the quid pro quo stuff instead of saying, let's specialize. And then we're doing different things. Then we can appreciate it more versus trying to keep score in the relationship. Well, I've had one baby. What have you done? Nothing. Okay. You know, like there's always these weird <laughs> trump cards that people can do. Right. And that's where you, that's where it can just be super unhealthy. So I think mm. if we, if we, if we love this, the specialization and we lean into it and say, that's why it's beautiful. My wife teaches dance. I have no idea how to do Irish dance. I've never done it except for a stupid little basic stuff. My wife does not do technology well, right? So when it comes to that business, it's phenomenal. She appreciates what I bring and I appreciate what she brings. And even in the family, I do all the science and math and technology stuff with the kids. She teaches a lot of the arts and the English to them. Right. So this is there's a great synergy. And that's, I think, intensifies the passion. Right. That's why it brings it because you're like, wow, it's so good to have that energy rather than it being this competition. Like, well, you need to help the child with their math. Why? why? Just because, you know, like you get into these weird things and you don't have these synergies. <laughs> so that's that's kind of where I think if we really look at the synergies and say, I'm going to bring 100 percent to the table and you're going to bring 100 percent. And if it's going to be crappy, sometimes the cars are going to break and then we have to do different things, but we'll just make it work because we're partners, right? We're not competitors. And that's where it feels like a lot of people are trying to compete for the same jobs with their partners. And nowadays. Yeah. And I think that's, again, this is a huge part of the work that I do when I see clients in, in therapy is um, talk about this thing called like in a, a marriage has to be a two-person psychological system, right? Where there is an us that is being prioritized versus, and, and then when there is not enough of, and we, it's not psychological safety, it's more like a body-based nervous system to nervous system, a neuroception of safety. But when we don't have that, then we are, it's, it's a you versus me, right? It's competition, not collaboration. Whether it's the business or the family, if there isn't that inherent sense of um, safety, then the whole thing gets hijacked. And I also think the, uh, one of the big reasons that it has happened is that there are bigger forces at play, right? So you have systems of you know patriarchy and capitalism where we've consistently devalued caregiving roles in the way we pay them like to, to take an example and we were just talking about the doctor versus the nurse thing earlier mm -hmm. um when you think about it as a family and that's different but when you think about it for example if you worked for a for-profit organization say you were supporting women at birth then the midwives and the nurses are the ones that actually spend a lot of time with the couple, not mm -hmm. the doctors. And yet they get paid, I don't know, one tenth of what the doctors make because we're prioritizing emergency obstetric technical skills over the very real um, psychological skill of making the mother feel competent, less scared, um, so her body can actually produce oxytocin, not adrenaline. And that's what makes labor happen. You know? And yet mm -hmm. that extraordinary skill is devalued in a monetary sense in terms of how we treat, incent, and respect different caregiving professions in the workplace. And I think that devaluing outside the home kind of sometimes also translates to inside the home. And that's where the resentment and all of that comes. But also I think home is, is the place where we can make that change. I think we're not going to dismantle capitalism in the outside world structure. However, I think the biggest power that we have is to actually exactly what you said, uh, appreciate and acknowledge and set right that uh, 
difference in how things are valued at home. And I think that creates a really powerful sort of structure. And now a small break to talk about more resources. We've created an autonomic intimacy checklist for couples, which gives you a framework to understand nervous system to nervous system safety with your partner. It's free to download and use. It is available as a link on the episode show notes. And now back to our conversation. Uh, tell us about raising kids and you're, you're a dad of four and tell us about that. Well, yeah, I mean, this has been interesting because I've had a lot of flexibility with my, I mean, my, because I had a business, my Irish dance business, I always was, that was kind of the priority. And then I'd have these other businesses on top of it. And so it was always a little tricky in weighing them, but I always had more flexibility and I would always prioritize it. And also, you know, like I would go to work and then my wife would then be teaching classes at night. So I would come home from work and then I would have to take care of the children. There wasn't this, oh, hey, we both went to a work, right? So we kind of, my wife would take care of them during the day. I would take care of them during the night. She would make meals. I would make meals depending on what we needed. And so it was a very dynamic system. And I, I look at it and I'm like, well, I was doing a lot of the caregiving at some points, but then so was she. But there's a few books that I've come across, like there's a book called The Boy Crisis by Warren Farrell and John Gray, where they yes. talk about... Have you seen that when they talk about boys and there's like 50 bad outcomes that happen if the dad isn't involved and doesn't get to play with them. The biggest mm -hmm. was that I thought was a 15 point IQ lowering if they don't have a dad around. And yep. so I didn't, I didn't choose that necessarily, but because of how my wife and I had it going at our family, I had a lot of time to spend with my kids, to train them, to play with them, to, you know, make, make meals with them. So I prioritized probably because of my mom's teaching, I prioritized how to teach my kids. So all my kids, I taught them how to cook and they would cook with me and they would learn and they would work and they'd have to, have to clean the house, right? So there were all these factors where because I had this time of caregiving, but I almost look at it more like it's my, it's my opportunity. And I look at this in the onboarding. I look at it through the business lens of onboarding, right? That's what my job as a parent is. Society is super complicated. We don't really realize it. But there's so many rules and skills and we have math and English and all the sciences. So it's like, how do we onboard children into this complex society? That's my job as a parent. And so that's that was really the focus for us was how do we spend time with our family? Some families, I mean, you've probably seen it where they do so many activities with all their kids that they their the wife is essentially just running a limousine, you know, like shuttling oh kids God, from one yes. to another. <laughs> Oh my yep. God. Yes. <laughs> so, so in our family, I said, all of our kids are going to Irish dance because with the studio is behind my house, mm -hmm. right where my wife teaches again. So we chose that so that she wouldn't have to travel. Yes. Right. Cause it was, we wanted to do that. And then they all took Irish dance and then we let them play a few different things, but nothing big. And then we did a lot of stuff as a family. Right. I mean, my daughter, they wanted her to play soccer and I was like, that we're not going to do that because you want it competitively because it's going to take too much time, right? So it was very much a prioritizing of our family and our family values and keeping us together versus, hey, let's see if we can be, make you successful and be an amazing athlete, right? All my kids, we all ski, snow ski, we all um, play volleyball, but it's we've done those things together, hiking, biking, those type of things. But it's because of that intentional restriction on the number of things we're doing because oh I mean, if that you look... is huge i mean you're saying it as if like it's a it's a it's a it's a natural thing but i think if you the 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 instinct is to be competitive high achievement focused on when if you come with that kind of performance and achievement based either families or messages that you hear from the outside world that can be really hard to do is to actually intentionally slow down and prioritize what's important for the family because it's not sexy. It's not you have your kids like, hey, this one won this competition and this one did that and all of those things. And then also prioritizing 
and being very intentional about what makes sense. So you're saying it like it was easy, but I'm, I'm sure it, there's that, you know? <laughs> yeah, there, there was definitely some struggles about with my wife because she was like, I want my daughter to dance. And I'm like, this isn't going to be enough time if she does all these forms of dance that you did. So there was a little bit of struggle there. The, the thing that I also think that's interesting, my, in the book, the, the Flywheel, I talk about every family has a business model, which is mm-hmm. how they make money and survive, just like a business, right? And mm-hmm. if we run out of money, we're just as screwed up as a business is, right? We got to go yes. take loans. So it's there's this very similarity. And I break the business model into the strategy, which is your mission and purpose, your structure, which is, you know, are you going to be an extended family? Are you going to live just two parents? Are you going to be a single parent? Those are kind of the structures. And then you have meetings and processes. And then the last piece is culture. Like, what are your values in your family? And what are your rituals? What are your beliefs? Those things, if you look at a business model, and it sounds like based on your, you know, where you were living and all the work you were doing with a lot of these companies, you were very successful, right? And financial terms you've made so you've moved to India and done some other choices which we're probably balancing as I say it like your other asset your other resources right you're making probably good money but then you're like but my social resources my connections to my family my connections to my culture those are all getting lost right and that's where I think a lot of people are undervaluing those social connections because I mean there were I've had some pretty hard things in my own life I made a we had a, the 2007, 2008 financial crisis in the U.S. Yes, yes. I lost, I lost a lot of money in real estate at that point, and I was very down on myself. Very had a lot of, you know, I was in a depression, you could say, right? Mm-hmm. And who helped me? My wife, she did some stuff, and then my dad, who was nearby, and my mom, right? Those are the people, those social resources who help you get through those mentally tough times, and so that's where I think those social resources have been severely undervalued. And the the things I would classify as a social resources, those are your relationships with your, with people directly or your relationships with the group or your reputation. And that's, what's so funny. If you look in a business, those relationships are marketing and sales. And you would say who in the world would ever neglect sales and marketing, (laughs) right? That's so dumb. It's so obvious, but in our families, we're neglecting that same exact thing. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, you know, who is investing for those social relationships? And are we as a family investing in those? And so that's where I think that we've kind of lost pieces. Like we have our business model, but because of what society is doing, it's pushing us just to maximize financial resources. Exactly. Oh my God. And that is coming at a huge cost to the nervous system. You know, mm-hmm. stress, the high achievement, the singular uh, running behind money. And that's the thing, right? When you get off that ladder and I come from, um, this whole, everybody, a lot of my friends are doing that for you know, VC and P and, and there's nothing wrong with it, but it's, it's just a different pace, but also as a family being very intentional about what you're prioritizing. If, um, if it's, and there is also a lot to be said for where you put your heart, your breath and soul. That's what you see later on, right? So if there was an almost singular focus on wealth creation, mm-hmm. uh, you, then you like a business, right? That runs, takes a lot of VC money and tries to go really quickly. And it's all about the, and then you know, the fundamentals of the operation and the health, and mental health, nervous system health, you know, mm-hmm. all of that, then you are going to see the effects of it further down the line. You know, so uh, putting it in business terms, I think is so valuable, so, so valuable to look at, to look at the family like a business, even metaphorically. I think that were, it really is a game changer in terms of understanding the, the importance of that. So uh, yeah. thank you so very much for that. Um, well, the other piece I also want to talk about, and you talked about this. There's the financial resources, there's the social resources, and the last one, like you say, that's the human resources. That's our abilities, our time, and our health, our physical, our mental, and spiritual health. We need to invest in all three categories to have a successful family and a successful life, right? That's what I think people are often, like I say, they're just going for financial, and then they're going, oh, I have all this money, and I, my wife hates me. I'm divorced. <laughs> my kids hate me. 
and mm -hmm. I'm sick. And, and so it's shakes. like, really? Yeah. Yeah. I'm sick. Yeah. Or you'll see people who are just like, you know, sometimes you'll get so hard on their career and then they're yeah. 35 or 40. And then they're like, well, now I have no children. I have no spouse. And now I have, was it worth it? And I'm not saying there's a right. That's why I like the business model is there's so many different business models. There's not a correct one. Google, Apple, Facebook, they all have different business models. But if you don't get an aligned business model, you won't be successful. So that's where I think it's more like, what business model are you using? And do you understand the consequences, right? Like, like that's where you look at the Facebook model with ads and you're like, well, I don't know that that's the best thing for people, but we're going to do that. So, so that's where I think having people say, here's the tools. And just like, I'm sure you're great with strategic consulting in a business. You're like, oh, you're under investing in marketing or you, your cash flows out of whack. There's all these things that are so good in business. But if you look at the family, it's the same thing. If you understand, there's only those three resources you invest in as a business or family, and there's a business model, and there's the three core components there. If you understand that, you can make sense of every family in the entire world, why they're successful or not. Right? Yes, that's, that's how I've seen it. <laughs> Thank you. I think that was very useful. Um, tell us how people can reach you and tell us how people can work with you. Yeah. So I have the book. You've seen it. The family flywheel. Yes. It has this circular yes, nature it. on it because it's yes. a system. It feeds back, right? The idea is you get richer and richer or in wealth and relationships and health. Um, so the book is on Amazon. I have a website called thefamilyflywheel.com. If you'd like to email me, you can email me at Aaron at the family flywheel.com, or you can find me on Facebook at Aaron K. Shelley or LinkedIn, Aaron K. Shelley as well. Thank you so much, Aaron. It was a pleasure. Yep, it was it's been fun. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for joining me today on Nerve to Lead podcast. The music you hear in this podcast was created by Soundcreed. You can find their link in the description. Thank you to Vaishnavi in Team Sangpar for producing and editing this podcast. Did this episode resonate with you? If it did, please share it with your friends, family, co-workers or clients. We would also love to hear from you. Drop us a note on www.sandpart.com